My name is Michael Gaia, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me today is Richard Murphy. Richard, first time you and I uh, speak, introduce yourself to the audience and to me. Who are you? What have you done throughout your career? And what are you doing currently? I'm sitting here in the UK this afternoon, as far as I'm concerned, 3 p.m. And what am I doing? I'm a chartered accountant, a CPA in US terms, near enough. But I'm now professor of accounting at the University of Sheffield after a career that has involved being senior partner of a practicing firm, being a serial entrepreneur, being a tax justice campaigner. And I can honestly say I'm probably the only guy in the world who's created an accounting system that is now the law in 90 countries around the world. And I'm pretty much single handedly responsible for that. Along the way, I also helped co-create the Green New Deal, which in the States is well known as a Democrat cause, but is more broadly based inside Europe. I'm one of the co-authors of that originally. So I've got a sort of a pretty broad mix of portfolio interests. All right, so there's gonna be a lot of different directions we're gonna go. First of all, I just wanna go after the, the way you describe yourself in your X profile, which is economic justice campaign. What is that for <laughs> the audience? <laughs> My wife always says that's the nightmare question when I'm introduced to parties. Look, the answer is that I realized when I was early midlife that I wasn't totally happy with everything that I was seeing and the way the world's economic system was working, in particular the way in which tax was working, which was seemingly horribly biased towards the interests of the rich. Tax havens were being used widely by corporations, by firms of accountants, lawyers, and banks to basically abuse and even undermine the revenues of elected governments. And I wasn't too hot on that either. And the tax burden was shifting from those who had the capacity to pay it to those who didn't because governments still needed revenues. And so I got heavily involved in tax justice to deal with that. Since then, my sort of themes have broadened out. If you read my blog, Log, which is called Funding the Future. The themes are much broader than just tax. In fact, if I want to write an article which people don't read, basically I should write about tax because people don't read those ones very much. That's perhaps not surprising. But I look at the more general approach that is required as to how we can manage the economy to make sure that everybody joins in on the journey and it's not just a few who get all the benefit. Well, what's funny is that everything you just said, I can obviously apply to how things work in the States and the U.S. Yeah. Here. So it's not that something that's uh, specific to any particular country. There's something to power and using tax uh, from an abusive perspective that uh, not only enables the, tab, the, the power and concentration of that power, but also the continuation. Of Absolutely. It. And I spent quite a lot of time, oh, particularly from 2009 to 2013 in the States, talking about some of these issues. So in that period, I was a regular transatlantic flyer. Not so often these days, but I was then. What, what, is there any kind of like a, a Green Roots approach or response by those in the UK to try to counter some of these uh, inequities that are being done from the tax code there. I mean, here in the U.S., I think most people are just, they complain about taxes, but they're either too distracted to actually uh, do something about it. There is a significant difference in the attitudes either side of the Atlantic, the pond, whatever you wish to call it. We are certainly more inclined to tackle tax abuse in the U.K. and Europe. And I think in the States, that is partly expressed through some of the antagonism, which I know arises between U.S. politicians and the OECD, which is based in Paris. The OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is one of those post-war institutions created to help manage the world economy and which deals well I'm a, with tax primarily from my point of view, also with development, which most of the world don't know as much about because the UN tends to be more powerful there. But it's a very, it is the writer of the world's tax rules. And these tend to be more powerful. Their initiatives tend to have more impact in Europe, partly because the European Union is obviously able to amplify them. So once it has adopted a position, which perhaps the UA OECD first promoted, it becomes the law you know, in 27 states now, because of course the UK has left. But the UK is still actively involved in that. And the whole sort of tax justice agenda picked up very much more strongly here after the global financial crisis of 2008. There was a London OECD summit Oh, no, it was a G20 summit, sorry, but the OECD was obviously there. In April 2009, it was Obama's first foreign trip. I was in the room. I was there at the invitation of 
Downing Street at the time because of the work that I was doing. And I have been to other G20s and G8 since. And it was clear that the political appetite for this was stronger in Europe than it was in the US. There is a more, there's a higher tax, higher benefit mentality over here than in the US. And so I think that ha- makes a difference. Okay, so that's actually interesting from a, a, a cultural perspective. So it sounds like, because obviously inflation is a tax as well. I don't agree with that. And, but. <laughs> okay, well, okay, let, okay, let's play with that. But just on the point about uh, the view of taxation, what from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds as if, if you're sitting in the UK or just the Eurozone in, in general, you feel like you're getting more for those tax dollars and on what you're saying, uh, somebody in the States might uh, otherwise think with their respective taxes. Well, we have a different, yeah, I think generally in the past, I don't think quite so much in the present. There's a high degree of dissatisfaction with government here at the moment. Now, that's something which is not uncommon in the world at large at present. There has been dissatisfaction, which has grown ever since the global financial crisis in 2008, because governments then moved towards austerity, the UK in particular did, and cut down heavily on government spending on certain programs which are now creating real social stress in our society, particularly with regard to healthcare, social care, the care for the elderly, which is now becoming extremely difficult. We have uh, 7.8 million people waiting for healthcare treatment in the UK NHS at the moment, which is well over 10% of the entire UK population waiting for an appointment because the system which used to function really well isn't anymore. And the single explaining factor is shortage of cash from central government. So obviously that is creating stresses between the taxes paid and the delivery aspect of this. If people think that they are buying a service, they don't think they're getting it anymore. However, they do want it. And I think that's the important point. If there was somebody who was willing and brave enough to actually say, I will raise taxes to provide you with a guarantee that you will see your cancer consultant within two weeks of first having a scare and you will then get the follow ups you want, you know, very quickly, I think that would be extremely popular. At the moment, there is some reluctance to do that. So we have got a major cultural crisis going on about what is the relationship between society, tax, government, services, the structure of services, are they private, are they public, the interaction between those two. And the one thing I can say that is not picking up much traction is the idea of a US uh, medical system. But there are some attractions now being looked at to some of the continental European alternatives to an NHS as a result of what is going on. So it's a complicated time for all of these relationships. And that's part of what makes my job really interesting. Because one of my great interests as an academic is the boundaries between various structures within society. And that's what I look at as an accountant. What is the edge of the corporation? When does corporation begin and end? Where's its responsibility beginning and end? Where's government's responsibility? How do we try to determine those things is what I really look at in an academic sphere. But that spills over into the work I do as a campaigner, obviously. All right. So so let's go to why you said you you very quickly said I don't agree with the idea that inflation is a tax because that's often put out there quite a bit. I think most people intuitively believe that. Um, I myself do as well. But why did you say you don't agree with the idea that inflation is not a tax? Is it imposed by government through a mechanism in created by law to require payment to it as a consequence of you know some form of legislation passed? No, so it's not a tax. Simple, straightforward. It can't be a tax. Tax is a charge imposed by a government in pursuit of law, and inflation isn't, so inflation can't be a tax. Inflation is not collected. Inflation might reduce the value of the pound in your pocket, but that's not a tax. It's just a misuse of the language. It doesn't even make any economic sense to call it a tax to me. Sorry, but I just don't get the terminology at all. Inflation can be good news for some people, can be bad news for other people. So it's a very weird redistributive tax, tends to be pretty good news for wealthy people, tends in the short term to be bad news for poorer people because their incomes tend to be either fixed or do not react quickly enough. In the longer term, it's bad news for wealthier people because it undermines the value of the assets that they own in the form of debt. And most assets eventually come down to some form of debt. It's good news in the long term for poorer people because they tend to owe more debt. So you're talking about something which doesn't behave in any shape, sense or form like a tax. It's a it's about money. And there is a relationship between tax and money, undoubtedly. And I'm more than willing to explore what that is. One is the fundamentally the flip side of the other. But what it definitely is not is a tax. 
Okay, I think it's a good way to frame it. Though perhaps we can argue or maybe go back and forth on the effect on government debt is you can argue maybe somewhat similar, right? So you can tax pay off government debt or you can inflate it away. Oh, well, that's true of all debt. I mean, let's be honest, I'm, I'm an enormous recipient of the value of inflation. And so it's just about every boomer. You know, I happen to be age 65. I'm officially an old age pensioner in the UK next March. I'm a boomer. I'm sitting in my house, which you know, is no secret. You could find this out from searching the public record. My I own. There's no mortgage on it. And I promise you, I didn't pay in terms of settling mortgage liabilities or in any other way, the full cost of the house that I now own. Inflation has given it a value, which I did not pay for. So I have an asset worth, which has been inflated by debt. The value of government debt is eroded mm -hmm. in the same way by inflation. But again, that doesn't make it a tax. It does make it a basis for charging tax on unearned um, economic well-being, which you never actually had to suffer a cost to generate. So it does provide a basis for arguments about wealth tax, although in broad terms, I'm not that keen on wealth taxes per se, because I think they're virtually impossible to charge and impose. I just speak as an accountant there. I don't know how you would value the assets to impose a general wealth tax. And so those who talk about it have never tried to do a negotiation of asset valuation with a revenue authority, because if they have, they wouldn't want to do that all the time. But when I... Look at that whole structure. I can't come up with anything that justifies that as a tax. It is merely a way of reorganizing power within economic power within society. And inflation certainly does that. So that means it's a subject for consideration within political economy, because political economy is about how the relationships of power allocate resources within society in a way that is way beyond the market consideration, which is what pure economics normally looks at. Okay, so actually, let, let's play with that wealth tax point, because I'm pretty sure that's a key component of what goes into modern monetary theory in quote working, right? That you can tax, you know, the very wealthy and take some of those, that wealth to effectively try to better manage the inflation of a country. And as you alluded to, that's pretty much an impossibility. They, they hear the states, they constantly talk about it. There's no way you can do it in any, in any practical way. Modern monetary theory is, not, theory is not something that's necessarily new. It's not something that's just U.S. specific. I, I am curious to hear your thoughts on if what's happened the last two, three years uh, is maybe a repudiation of the theory altogether. Look, I'm, I'm not a pure modern monetary theorist. I've read a lot of it. According to Randy Ray, who is one of the leading proponents of MMT, my work on tax and MMT is one of the rare contributions to the theory of modern monetary theory, which came from somebody outside the fairly small group who've created it. But I know most of those people, Warren Mosler, Stephanie Kelton, Bill Mitchell, et cetera, um, and Randy and others. MMT does not say most of what most people says it says. And I think that's one of the great weird things about it. There's a massive mythology about MMT. And when you bring it down to it, MMT simply says a, a government can create money. Unless it creates money and spends it into the economy, there is no currency available to pay tax because where does the currency come from? If it doesn't come from the government, nobody else creates a currency. Nobody else can declare it legal tender. And LMT actually says that tax is absolutely fundamental to the existence and nature of a currency because unless tax is demanded, then there's no reason why that particular currency should be attributed with value. And value is attributed by the fact that you have to have it, that particular currency in the States, the dollar here, the pound sterling, to settle your tax liability. And I know that's true in the UK because it says on a UK banknote, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever else. But in practice, the only way in which that liability is settled is by the fact that the government will accept that note in settlement of a tax liability. So the, the money that the government creates day in, day out, which is all that MMT really says, um, that there is no such thing as non-government created money, ultimately, is cancelled through the operation of a tax system. So when I said earlier that money and tax are the flip side of each other, I genuinely think they are. One does not exist without the other. I don't actually think tax funds anything that is spent by government. That's as poor a theory as the intermediation model, the financial intermediation model of banking, because banks do not take deposit the funds and lend them. We know that's not true. Most central banks around the world have now agreed that, including the Bank of England, the, the German Federal Bank, the Canadian Federal Bank. I'm not sure whether the US Fed has agreed that's the case or not. I can't remember. But you know, financial intermediation by banks doesn't happen. Uh, banks create 
money when they make loans and the money is destroyed when the loan is repaid and governments create money when they spend. People accept that currency as legal tender because A, it's been declared as such and B, they need it to pay tax. And the payment of tax cancels the liability they owe to the government, but the government's already done its spending without the tax. Now, therefore, people say MMT says you don't need tax to spend. Well, look, in tiny quantities, that's true. But in terms of running a macro economy, that's never true. The reality is that few governments want to run a significant deficit. They can, very clearly. They did. In the UK, we had a 400 and 50 billion deficit in 2020-21. That's you know, a record. That was paid for entirely by money creation. It was disguised by quantitative easing, but I make it clear quantitative easing is just a sham, a transaction put in place to pretend that the government is actually not borrowing directly from its own central bank um, when it is, um, because it did. And how do I know that, by the way? Because that is what is reflected in the audited accounts of the UK government. The audited accounts of the UK government show that it borrowed from the central bank. Our Office for National Statistics, which produces the figures for the national debt, says it didn't. One of those is right and one of those is wrong. Well, actually, it's the audited accounts which are right and the official UK national debt figures that are wrong. And that's an issue about which I'm at the moment doing academic research and writing a journal paper because nobody seems to have actually bothered about the issue, but it's absolutely fundamental to understanding proper accounting and proper economics, as far as I can see. And this is a relationship we need to understand. But I genuinely feel that most people don't have much comprehension of what money really is. It is simply debt. There's nothing else to it. That is all there is. That's all there ever has been to money. Even when we had asset backed money, it was just a token representation of um, the debt. And notes and coins are token representation of debt owing. So instead of being recorded in a ledger, which is where electronic money is recorded, then notes and coins are token representation of the money. But that is this lack of understanding of money. And in that sense, the lack of understanding of what MMT has tried to say, which is remarkably simple in its actual description, is worrying. MMT doesn't help itself. Let's be clear about this. Some of the, particularly some of the proponents, and Bill Mitchell and I famously don't get on very well, and I'm not going to pretend otherwise, because Bill writes all sort of stuff and says, MMT says this. And my answer is, no, your politics say that, Bill. MMT does not say that. You have extrapolated to make it seem as though MMT could say that, and you can use MMT to justify your argument. But that isn't what MMT says. MMT simply says a government creates money spends it into circulation and taxes it back to the extent that it needs to control inflation. And the control of inflation is in MMT, the fundamental reason for taxing. It does not rely on interest rates. So the difference, the fundamental difference between MMT and some other ways of thinking is this emphasis on interest rates. It is where MMT will disagree with some neo-Keynesians and definitely with some pure Keynesians, because Keynes was actually pretty monetarist. If you read the 1936 um, work, his general theory, there's a quite a large element of monetary theory in there. Uh, the neo-Keynesians were much less monetarist, and MMT is certainly less monetarist in the sense of this lack of dependence upon interest rates as a mechanism to control inflation. It depends upon a flexible enough tax system to do that job instead. Sorry, that's a diatribe, but I hope it made sense. No, no, no. That, that actually, that, that, that's very good. Actually, that point about sort of the flexible tax system is is why I think it also becomes challenging. You know, if you have to tax, going back to the wealth tax argument, if you have to tax the very wealthy to. No, you don't. Let's tax. be clear. The wealth tax has nothing to. I've never seen anyone seriously proposing wealth taxes as part of MMT. That's really the absolute wrong end of the spectrum that MMT would be interested in. MMT is interested in mass taxation because you need to collect large amounts of money. And wealth taxes only ever collect, frankly, pretty inconsequential amounts of money. Yeah, there are, but, well, but presumably there's going to be some limit to that, right? I mean, okay, that, that may be the case. Being more deficits increase and more you have to increase taxes, okay, that's fine. But on the entire population, okay, I'm fine with that, obviously. But there's got to be some natural limit to that where that becomes now problematic for society to even function. Well, look, there's an obvious limit to society and its ability to function, and that is full employment. And so MMT 
Well, no, let's ignore MMT. Just let's talk about a government, any government. If a government says, I'm going to put into place a program to build a new interstate this or a new space program that, or we're going to build 500 new hospitals or whatever it is that the, you know, the federal government decides and Biden goes along and does another IRA and says, you know, this is what we're going to spend money on. But there isn't actually the resource within the economy to deliver. But he tries to, or whoever another president might be, tries to go and spend on a program for which there aren't the actual physical resources to do the work, then they are going to create inflation because they're trying to buy something that doesn't exist. If you try to buy something that doesn't exist, the price of what does exist will go up because it's now in scarce supply and there's an excess demand for it. So the problem is not anything to do with MMT. The problem is actually trying to overstimulate demand when you haven't created the capacity to deliver that's where the problem is. MMT has the capacity to withdraw the excess demand by taxing. And if you are trying to change the profile of spending within an economy, so you decide as a government that you actually do genuinely believe that the state should play a bigger role than it does now. Yeah, let's put forward the impossible suggestion that American healthcare is to become entirely state managed and run, um, which I really don't think was ever going to happen. Then you would obviously have to increase taxes to manage the fact that the government would now be spending the money into the economy to pay all the employees inside the American medical system. So you'd have to increase it. But so long as the same number of people were employed, that would not by itself be inflationary or create a problem. You actually have simply changed the employment structures, and the fact that you charge more tax is simply to recover the fact that you're spending more on those people, which you're not now recovering out of insurance premiums paid. So people may be or may not be, depending on how large those premiums are and whether they're paid by their employer or not, but they may or may not be better off by the extra amount of tax paid or not. I mean, it's an argument, but certainly in the US, you pay a lot more for healthcare than we do in Europe massively more, almost double the price, near as damn it, as a share of GDP. So you could argue you know, that this might release an efficiency. But is there a natural limit there? No, because there are trained medical staff in America to do the job. But if you try to do something you haven't got trained people to do, then you are going to create inflation. But that's not a problem down to MMT. That's a problem down to the shortage of resources. It, MMT doesn't say a government can spend whatever it likes for as long as it does. I mean, I think there are some idiots who think it says that, but if they are, they don't understand MMT. You know, Stephanie Kelton's book, um, what was it called? I've forgotten. I turned around to look at it. The Deficit Myth. It's on my shelf. Well, a lot of books are on the shelf behind me, if you could see a video, about a thousand or so. And that book mentions inflation apparently 250 plus times because it's an obsession of hers. The whole point is that you aren't overspending you're actually using taxes to balance the economy around full employment. And that's the real point. You're balancing the economy around what it can achieve, full employment, rather than an artificial constraint, which is balancing the government budget, which is a meaningless task to do, partly because, well, next year, the pounds dollars, yen, euros, whatever it is you're balancing your budget in will not be worth the same as they are now. And anyway, who said you have to balance the government budget? If you actually want to have a growing economy, you almost certainly need to run a deficit. So, because, you know, if you understand the basic equations for macroeconomics, government spending, net government spending is a boost to, to the economy. So any government that wants to have a growing economy, and most governments around the world are still dedicated to that, despite green constraints, then you are going to need to spend. And so that constraint is an observed one. The constraint of full employment at a reasonable wage is a real one. And that's what MMT focuses on. And in that sense, I think MMT is right. But I stress, I'm not a full blown MMT proponent, and I'm certainly not a full-blown MMT apologist, I have readily agreed with all of those people who promote it, particularly around this role of tax, which I think is more significant than most of them suggest. But wealth tax is a tiny component of any tax system because it's actually quite difficult to collect taxes from wealth. It's very easy to collect more tax from income from wealth and from capital gains, but very hard to raise tax from wealth itself. Just to reset the room for a bit here, please make sure you follow Richard Murphy here on X. If you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button. And as always, this will be a podcast under Lead Lag Live on all of your favorite uh, platforms.
Speaking of constraints, there's a term that's being thrown out more and more around the, you know, FinX, whatever that word means nowadays, FinTwit community. It's this concept of fiscal dominance, right? The idea that whatever the, the monetary side of the central banks are trying to do to keep inflation low gets countered by government spending. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that dynamic, because that seems to be the one thing everybody now is convinced of. Well, that there is fiscal dominance. There's fiscal dominance that will over, override whatever the Fed or, or ECB or any central bank does. Well, look, I'm not a big fan of central bank independence, so I should put my cards on the table. Never had me, never will be. And actually, I'm not a great believer that any form of monetary policy can, in most situations, ever control inflation. I lived through the 70s. I think that there were situations in the 1970s when there was a reason to increase interest rates to control inflation because what existed at that time, powerful trade unions in many countries, were keeping wage rates higher than their natural rate of return, which had, and those wages rose artificially in response to the 1973 oil crisis in a way that did produce inflation from you know, 75, 76, 77, when we saw the, the, the real peaks at that period. And I think at that moment, there probably was a reason for using interest rates to control inflation because there was excess money available within the economy. And that spending power had to be removed. And that excess spending power was by and large with working people. That situation has never recurred since then. Um, it most certainly doesn't exist now. If you look around the UK economy, the one thing that is glaringly, obviously apparent, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the US and I'm not familiar as familiar with any other economy, but I know the UK economy very well. And I can see the parallels in all the reports I read on other economies. And the one thing that is apparent is that there's a shortage of spending power inside the UK economy at present, um, a desperate shortage of spending power, which is leaving many people, frankly, at risk of destitution. It's a, uh, and that's a Victorian word. There's destitution. We're not talking about poverty here. We're talking about you know poverty so deep that people are living in unimaginable states because they're being destroyed by high mortgage rates. Remember, we have variable mortgage rates here, whereas in the US, I know you tend to sign up for a mortgage rate for life. Well, over the life of the mortgage, that is, but hey, ours vary. So you can suddenly find you've moved from a you know 1% rate, which many people were able to get not that long ago, to a 6% rate, which is absolutely crippling on household budgets. We've seen wages rising way below the rate of inflation, so real pay cuts significantly of late. And that was after a decade of austerity, which left many people, in particular in the public sector, which is a significant part of the UK economy. If, you know, one in six people works for the government, and rather more indirectly, of whom quite a large number in healthcare. And they've all been in a situation of basically being underpaid for a long time. And so we're situ in a situation where we simply do not have a problem of excess spending capacity to eliminate, which is the only reason for raising interest rates that a central bank has. The reason for raising interest rates is to take spending power out of the economy, and we don't have excess spending power in our economy. Instead, we've got war in Ukraine. We've now got war in the Middle East. We've had the COVID crisis. We had market disruption on reopening, and we know we had supply chain disruption during those periods. All of those things created disruptions to prices, most of which arose as a result of speculation. You know, there was actually no shortage of oil as a result of the war in Ukraine. There was no shortage of gas in Europe as a result of the uh, war, war in Ukraine. But you wouldn't have believed that based upon the way in which market prices moved. They've all, by the way, now returned to their pre-war levels. So has wheat, so have fertilizer costs moved pretty much back to all the same level. And fertilizer is a major export of Ukraine and Russia from the same broad area. So it was speculation that created that inflation. How was speculation in a country outside the UK going to be controlled by an increase in the UK's interest rate? They were utterly uncorrelated events. There was no reason why they would ever have an impact. Very marginally, I suppose, through the exchange rate, but not sufficient to make a big difference. And so the whole policy that's been put in place of very high penal, I mean penal seriously here, interest rate rises, which have ha are having dramatic effects on people's lives and which are likely to drive us to recession eventually, because I think the Bank of England has heavily overshot the level of interest rates it should have got to, even if this policy could be justified, is one where we are in now deep financial trouble. So do I think that there should ever be an emphasis on the central bank's opportunity to do monetary policy? No, it's always been a fiscal game. 
the fiscal game is not that it's fiscal versus monetary. It's how do you manage fiscal spend versus fiscal tax? And the trouble is that we do have politicians who've forgotten that actually tax is in itself a macroeconomic control variable. Instead, they see it as a means of raising money to pay for expenditure. It isn't because their central bank will always pay for their expenditure, as QE proved, but about which they are in collective denial. Yeah, they just don't recognize that that happened, even though it obviously did. They believe the lie that QE represents as if it didn't. And so we have this failure to recognize that the right fiscal equation is tax versus spend, not interest rates versus government spend. And so we are looking at the wrong part of the government accounting system to find the control mechanism to take us out of the mess we're in. And as a result, we're not getting out of the mess we're in. You said something which is interesting. You said the Bank of England overshot. And I myself have argued that the Fed probably overshot because they themselves don't know how the long and variable lags kick in and when, right? I assume it's a similar dynamic with the UK. Yeah, exactly the same point. I, I think I'm probably making is that one you've just said very neatly. We have no idea how long it takes as a transmission mechanism. But in broad terms, if the biggest debt price transmission mechanism we have is the price of mortgage borrowing in the UK, and 85% of UK bank lending is mortgages on private homes. So that must follow. And by and large, these only get renegotiated every one, two or three years. I mean, depending on the sometimes five years, and depending on the package that somebody took and you know, their own risk aversion, then obviously there's a lag built into the system. What we do know is that in the coming year, a couple million more households in the UK, which is significant, when there are about 12 or 13, I think, million households with mortgages, are going to come onto new and very expensive mortgage packages as a result of what's happened. And that's going to have another enormous hit on spending power in the UK at a time when, as I say, we are already tottering on the brink of recession. Unemployment is looking as though it could well rise, um, is forecast to rise. Inflation is coming down, but due to factors entirely unrelated to anything to do with interest rate rises. In fact, I'd actually draw attention to some of the work that's been done in Sweden. Now, Sweden measures its inflation slightly differently from the mainstream, but they do explicitly recognize the impact of interest rates within their inflation measure. So they have a consumer prices index, which does actually analyze the impact of inflation. And they reckon half of all their consumer price index increase at present is down to the impact of interest rate rises imposed by their central bank. So far from interest rate rises actually cutting inflation, they are creating inflation. And I think we see that very strongly in the UK. We see that in some of the pricing mechanisms that are in use with regard to many contracts. Uh, which are automatically rise in line with inflation or interest rates. We see that, for example, that 90 plus percent of all cars in the UK are bought on short-term lease finance arrangements. And of course, the price of those changes fairly quickly in response to interest rate changes. And we're seeing it, you know, in any product which has an interest element built into the pricing. And so I, 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 and most in particular, we see it in rents because the UK has a very strong private rental market, most of which is heavily geared. And those landlords are passing on the price of their extra borrowing, which is tending not to be on short term, but long term fixed rates, but on short term variable rates. And they're passing that on. So we are seeing over 10% increases in rent costs per annum at present, which is way above the normal inflation rate. And that is a massive transmission mechanism for the interest rate rises into the economy. So, in fact, we have this weird structure of transmission mechanisms, some of which are very powerful in the short term, some in the long term. But overall, I do believe we've heavily overshot and we're heading for recession as a result. Transition a little bit to something you had mentioned at the very start of the conversation, the, uh, the green transition. Here in the States, I think there's a lot of skepticism, at least among the investment community, especially because of what's happened with oil. Where are we on the green transitions, where's that money going to come from? If we're at this point where maybe there's some natural limit to how much government debt there there can be, where's the money going to come from for all, this, all these hopes around green transitioning? Well, I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about that question, and I've written quite a bit about it. So thank you for asking, because I guess you must have seen something I've said. 
There are, I, I do a little bit. Good. I'm head. glad to know that. <laughs> <laughs> so you asked me a leading question. Look, there are three fundamental ways of raising money. One is extra tax. I do actually think that in some countries like the UK, we are under taxing those with wealth. If you actually take into consideration the combination of increased wealth over time plus income as and combining them as an economist would and saying, well, those two together might be called your utility and your utility has increased because of the combination of income and rising wealth. Um, and we look at the tax rate, overall tax rate on that combined source of increase in well-being then broadly speaking, the poorest people in the UK are paying tax rates of over 40% on their income and the wealthiest are paying tax rates of only just over 20%. So um, quite clearly, there's a capacity to tax income from wealth in particular more. And I have been working on programs to show that some of the arguments that there is no money left are just meaningless claims because there's plenty of money left. It's just not being taxed. So we could tax more. I'm actually much more interested in something else. And that is that I believe that in the modern economy, there's been a fundamental breakdown in the relationship between savings and investment. Now, when you are studying economics 101 as an undergraduate, you try, you, know, you work through all those formulas and are told that these um, must be true. And you end up by abstraction with the formula S equals I. Savings must equal investment. And I'm afraid to tell you that's complete and utter nonsense. Because in the modern economy, most investment is not funded by saving. As I've already said, bank intermediation is simply not true. Banks do not lend depositors money. They create new money when they make loans. It is also true that very few corporations now raise new equity share capital. In fact, most corporations are pretty dedicated to doing the exact opposite. Most of them spend most of their time repaying their equity share capital because it's tax efficient to do so. And instead, therefore, they are not raising funds from savers in that way. So, in fact, there's almost no mechanism which people's savings end up creating investment in the modern economy. And that's pretty weird. In the UK, we have financial wealth of a bit over 15 trillion pounds. Our GDP is supposedly 2.5 trillion. I've got reasons to doubt whether that's correct for a number of technical reasons. But it may be a factor of, you know, six or seven times our GDP is the financial wealth. So we aren't short of money. Most of that, 80% of that is in some way in tax incentivized assets, by the way. That is pension funds or private houses, which are a tax incentivized asset because they're not taxed, or things called ICEs. We have a thing called an individual savings account, which is a tax-free savings structure, a lot of which is held in cash. Almost none of that, if we just look at the financial products in there, so the pension funds and the ICEs, together six to seven billion, roughly half of the financial wealth, most of that money is not in any way used to create new constructive investment in the economy. It's used for speculation. It's used to buy what I call secondhand pieces of paper. That is equities already in existence. And it is in surprisingly large amount held on cash deposit. Some is lent to government. I actually don't think there is any such thing as government debt. That's a pretty contentious claim to make. I happen to think that governments run pretty sophisticated and rather useful banking operations, which are enormously valued by people who don't say that they actually couldn't survive without them. And um, who are those people who couldn't survive without them? Well, pension funds and the banking system. Um, the whole repo market is, for example, in Europe, entirely dependent upon the existence of government bonds. And I think it probably is in the States as well. So there is this incredibly sophisticated banking operation that the governments run, but I don't think they actually have a debt system. I mean, we don't say that a bank is horribly in debt if it's taking deposits, and that's what the government does. It takes deposits. Now, that's a big mindset for you to get your heads around, I must admit, but that's exactly what they do. They're just simply taking deposits. Now, what if they could take deposits as a government and say, let's sort of get rid of these banks who don't need cash, which is the reason why banks don't pay very much interest on cash, because frankly, it's a useless commodity for them, except as another capital buffer in the event of their own failure, which isn't a great concern because government bank guarantees normally cover that risk. And instead, that money is actually used in what I would suggest is a form of hypothecated savings account. And we say to people, well, if you're really worried about the green transition, 
save in a high pocketed savings account. They could be these ISAs we have here that could be through your, was it 411k or whatever it is in the States? I've forgotten the, the, the number. Is that right? That's the pension fund arrangement? A 401k. 401k, yeah. So you could do it through your, that arrangement and you could actually save for the long term. Some of the testing that I put out on this, and we've done a little bit of you know, work just trying to sound people out, suggests that people get really quite excited when they realize that they could actually save in a way which would result directly in investment. Whether that investment be in social housing, which there's a dire need for in the UK, or whether it would be for the health service, because you know, the health service is the closest thing that's closest to a religion we've got now in the UK. That's a joke, but it's not entirely misplaced. But I will make that point, just in case anybody's offended. Or it could be in the green transition, or it could be in more directly in transport, energy systems, transmission systems, whatever you like. And we could actually put in place arrangements where instead of people making cash deposits, where frankly, the money has almost no use, or equity investments where the funds are simply used for speculative purposes, we do instead actually see the recreation of this relationship between S and I. Now, if that was to be the case, we would have the biggest economic revolution that we can imagine, because governments wouldn't then be dependent upon taxation revenue alone for their revenue, and they are borrowing. They are actually definitely are deposit-taking. They're capital facilitators, and they are putting into place the, an arrangement, which I think is a real arrangement, which is between the depositor and the user of the funds. And then that is something which hasn't existed in economies, basically, in my lifetime because of the failure of equity markets to achieve that result and because the way in which money was transformed post-1971, the end of the gold standard and everything else, money ceased to have any real meaning as uh, in, in financial intermediation terms. Money existed to the extent that anybody wanted to create it. So suddenly we, I, and I don't think the whole of economics has got its head around the fact that this S equals I relationship no longer exists. And so my argument is that if we go to pay for the green transition, we need to rethink how we actually use the savings in our economies because that's the money that could be used. And I think there's an awful lot of people who would like their savings to be used for some constructive social purpose, particularly if a government guarantee was attached to it. I can give you a lot of credit, Richard. You're, you're uh, incredibly intelligent, knowledgeable, and uh, have a lot of passion, which is nice to see. I, I am curious. I mean, you, you put that ebook out there, and obviously you're yeah, you've done very well in your career. Why do you put so much effort and content out there? I mean, it sounds like you can just kind of coast <laughs> through life and, and be good. And I don't mean that as a criticism by, as a by any means, but I'm always fascinated by, you know, what keeps somebody motivated? Look, I, I could give up. You know, if I'm honest, I have enough pension fund probably available that I could give up. You know, I'm a bit of a passionate ornithologist. I spend my weekends out with a pair of binoculars. Thankfully, my wife is as well, which makes it a bit easier. And, you know, I could spend a lot of time just, I live in a beautiful part of England. I could just spend my time doing something else. Why don't I? Because I think there's a better world still to create. I've got two sons and I would like to think that I did my bit to make the world better for them. And I don't think I've succeeded as much as I'd like as yet. But I really, I suppose when it comes down to it, I mean, I write normally three blogs in the morning before breakfast every morning. I mean, I've written over three blogs a day on average every day for the last 17 years. That's over 20,000 blog posts now, nearly 21,000, I think. I don't know how many words it is, millions, many millions. Why do I do that? I wake up every morning and I just think, look, this world could be made better. There simply are things we could do better than we are, and people could be better off. And actually, very few people would be worse off if we made some people better off. I do actually genuinely think that there's a net gain. We aren't playing a zero sum here. There aren't just winners and losers. There are net gains to be had in society. If only we could tackle some of these problem problems and think through some of the theoretical impediments that we put in our way because we have, well, such a group to think about so many things. You know, there's only certain ways we can save, only certain ways we can invest. We misname things or we structure things incorrectly. And I'm just passionate about trying to actually make life better for people. And if I can, I've done my little bit for the day. I can then go off at the weekend and do some bird watching. Did you mention those posts, Richard, aside from X, where can people find you? Oh, my blog is called, well, the, the URL is taxresearch.org.uk. The blog is actually now called Funding the Future. But if you just literally put my name in and Richard Murphy Tax, I guarantee you I'll come up pretty high on Google. You know, when you've written that many blog posts, you tend to come up pretty high on Google. Even if you're in the States, I suspect I come up pretty high. I know there's some pretty notable Richard Murphys in the States. You know, I, 
isn't there a senator, Richard Murphy, at one time or whatever? Or well, is it a congressman? I can't remember which. Well, I'm not that one. But if you put Richard Murphy in tax, I'm probably going to come up. But Richard Murphy funding the future, that'll work too. Right. Please give uh, <clears throat> Richard a follow here on X. Make sure you check out his posts. Again, this will be in a podcast. And I've got a number of these spaces lined up throughout the week. So please make sure you turn those notifications on and uh, join those live. Uh, thank you, Richard. Really, I, I very much enjoyed the conversation. I think you're, uh, you put a lot of interesting perspective out there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.